Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Boucher. In this video, we're going to cover how anthropometry, or body dimensions, influence squat mechanics. For that, we have a model demonstrating the human torso, femur, tibia, foot and ankle, and the relationship between those. Now, before we get into it, I'd like to give credit to Tom Purvis, who's the first person that I've seen teach with a model similar to this, and to my student, Jack Campa, who helped construct this actual physical model. Now, before we start talking about anthropometry, there are a few important definitions to review. First, we'll talk about the line of gravity. This vertical bar here represents the line of gravity, or the force of gravity passing through the barbell towards the center of the Earth. Next, a moment arm is a horizontal distance from a, the line of a force to a joint. So here we see the moment arm at the hip from the hip joint to the line of gravity. Here we see the moment arm at the knee from the knee joint to the line of gravity. Next we'll talk about the relationship between the tibia and the torso. And what we see is that the more vertical the tibia, the more inclined the torso, and vice versa. The more inclined the tibia, the more vertical the torso. What you'll also see is that the moment arms at the knee and hip change as the tibia becomes more vertical, the knee moment arm decreases and the hip moment arm increases. This places less stress at the knee and relatively more stress at the hip. With the more inclined tibia, the knee has more stress and the hip and low back have relatively less stress. Now, Although we can't change the femur length in an actual human, on this model, we can adjust the femur length to see what happens when two individuals, perhaps two individuals of a similar build, but with different length femurs, attempt to squat. This individual has a relatively shorter femur, and they're in a parallel position in their squat. Okay. If we were to take the same person and give them a longer femur, we would see a few things happen. The hips have pushed up and back. This increases the moment arm at the hip, meaning more torque or more rotational force at the hip. It also, because the hip moved up, means that this individual now has to work harder to get to a below parallel position, often required in strength sports. Now let's take a look at what happens when we adjust the tibia. If I could take someone's tibia and make it longer, we'd see a few things happen. The knees move forward, increasing the moment arm at the knee. The hips moved down and under, which actually brought the torso more upright. So by having a longer tibia, this individual has a more upright squat. And look what happened to the height of the hips too, drop below the height of the knee, meaning that it's much easier for this individual to get to a below parallel squat. While we cannot adjust the length of a torso in a real, a real human, we can functionally change the length of the torso by changing the position of the bar on the individual's back. So if an individual is squatting with a bar, with a higher bar placement, it makes it functionally as if the torso were longer. If I were to take this bolt here, which represents the bar placement, and move it to a lower position on the back, what we'll see, first note the incline of the torso, what we'll see is that now, at a parallel position, so we're going to drop him again to reach a parallel position, at a parallel, thigh parallel position, his torso is more inclined forward. Okay. This matches what we see in the real world where low bar back squats, the kind typically seen in powerlifting versus Olympic weightlifting, low bar back squats typically have a more inclined forward inclined torso and use more of these posterior chain muscles and relatively less stress on the quads. The last thing that this model can help us to understand is what happens when we elevate the heel. So here we see the individual again at approximately a thigh parallel position, okay, heel flat on the ground. I'm going to take the foot segment and change it so that the heel is now elevated. Yeah, this is the kind of change we would see if the uh, individual was wearing an Olympic weightlifting shoe with a thick elevated heel. Okay. 
Now the change that we see going from here to here, the knee move forward, the hip also move forward, bringing it closer to the line of gravity. This means relatively more stress at the knee, relatively less stress at the hip. The trunk became more upright, okay, which is beneficial for things uh, like front squats and overhead squats or cleans and snatches. And we also see as there was a change in angle at the knee and here at the hip. With the heel elevated, we see relatively less hip flexion and more knee flexion than with the heel flat on the ground. Changing that could have implications for the person uh, with relatively less hip flexion. That might be good for somebody, say, with femoral acetabular impingement that isn't comfortable with deep hip flexion. Relatively more knee flexion, that could be good or bad, but might not be great for somebody with something like a tear in the posterior horn of the meniscus that doesn't do so well with deep knee flexion. So selecting your shoe might be based off the joint angles that you want, might also be based off of whether your sport, something like a weight, Olympic weightlifting requires a very upright torso, or things like back squatting and deadlifting that work just fine with a more inclined torso. Uh, so a sport like powerlifting, which traditionally uses a relatively flat, thin shoe. We should also address some limitations of, of this physical model. Now clearly, human beings are not fixed to a track. When we squat, we can move in all sorts of ways other than straight up and down, unless we're squatting on a Smith machine. However, because this vertical line represents the line of gravity, which is now relatively centered in the foot, we do have to stay close to that line of gravity with the weight of the barbell. Otherwise, we'd lose our balance and fall over. If this line of gravity falls outside of the foot, which serves as the base of support, the athlete would lose their balance and miss the lift. The heavier the lift, the more tightly the athlete needs to regulate how this barbell tracks directly over the center of their foot, or this line of gravity stays centered within the base of support. Another limitation of this model is that we're viewing it from the side, or taking what we call a sagittal plane view. This gives us a lot of information, but it's not a complete picture. We'll use a couple of separate images of a real human to take a look at how changes in squat width can change these body positions in ways that can't be shown with this model. So here we see two images of the same athlete squatting with two different foot positions. On the left, the athlete is demonstrating a hip width stance. On the right, the athlete is squatting with the feet positioned wider than shoulder width. This widening of the feet causes the turning of the femur and an apparent shortening in a front to back distance, or what we might call sagittal plane distance. This shortening in the sagittal plane brings the hip closer to the line of gravity that we discussed earlier and may bring the knee closer to the line of gravity as well, depending on that athlete's mobility. This athlete, who has excellent ankle dorsiflexion, demonstrates a significant change in the position of the tibia with a more upright tibia when using the wider stance. Depending on the athlete's mobility, we'll either see a more upright tibia, a more upright torso, or a combination of the two when squatting with a wider stance.